Hey guys, my name's Scott Niemeyer and I'm the lead pastor here at High Point Church. I wanna welcome you to our podcast. We hope that you are inspired and encouraged by the word today. Let's jump in and let's get started. My name is um, Kelly and Scott and I are the lead pastors here. We have the honor of um, leading this church, amazing church. We're about four years old. If you're a first time guest, we, I wanna echo what everybody said. We wanna say welcome home. I like to say that we believe church is not an event you attend, but a family you belong to. So our heart is that when you walk in, you feel welcome. And we're so glad that you're here today. Um, if you are a first time guest, I always put this disclaimer in. I'm sorry for anything I'm gonna say, okay? So just give me grace. Come back next week and hear Pastor Scott. He's really good. You really can laugh there. You got, y'all are hard this morning. My goodness. Okay. All right. Maybe I should start off with a prayer. Can I pray over you this morning? <laughs> Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. Lord, I just pray that every word that comes out of my mouth, Lord, will will come straight from you. Father, I thank you that you have a promise in your word that I'll take your words, God, and the word of God and throw it out there as seed. And I thank you that it will not return void, but it'll just plant in each person's heart. Father, it it will produce a harvest in us of um, just being a light to the world and those that are hurting and need you. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, um, let's reset. So you need to laugh at my jokes because if you don't, I get really discouraged, okay? So I'm going to test you right now and I'm going to tell a joke. But before I do, I want to let you know that we are in a series right now, our summer series called This Is Us. We decided to do this because we've never really talked about our core values. Now, when you walk into the church, and we are portable, as you all know, um, we have our core values hanging on a sign. And when you walk into the right, but if you're walking straight in, you might miss them. And we also talk about them in our grow track. If you haven't been through grow track, I want to encourage you to do that. It, it, it does exactly what it's called. It grows you in your discipleship but it also kind of lets you know about High Point Church and how it got started. If you're interested in becoming a member or serving on our team, we'd love to have you for that. But other than that, um, that's the only place we talk about our core values. So we really wanted to break them down over this summer. And so today I'm going to be talking about um, generosity, but I want to go over um, a few of our, um, I want to go over our core values really quick. I took too much time in the first service and ran out of time for my sermon. So I was going to go through them, but I want to encourage you to go back and listen to the ones that you've missed and be present for the rest of of July to hear the rest of them. They're really good. Um, Why do we have core values in our church? We set core values because we want our culture to reflect that of heaven. So I'm going to say that again. We want to have the culture of heaven. You know, every house has a culture. Your house may have a certain culture. My house has a culture. And by the way, culture is the way we do things. It's the way we operate. It's what we allow, what we don't allow. And if you don't set your core values to drive that culture, then by default, there will be a culture that forms in your house. Pastor Scott talked about this a couple weeks ago that um, either you drive your house, you're, you're in charge, you're the head, or your kids are. Have you ever been to a house where the kids are in charge? And what's crazy is the parents don't even know it. They're like, oh, kids, kids will be kids. You're like, no, I've got five of them. That's not, that's not how it goes. I'm in charge. So a culture is a system, a way, a way that things are done in your home. So in our house, in the word of God, that's called the kingdom of God. And so there are culture points in heaven and the way that God does things. And we really want to reflect the heart of God. We want our core values in our church to reflect heaven. So we set seven core values and and, um, I want to go over them really quick. So I'm a teacher. I'm a school teacher. I don't know if you knew that or not. So I like to, sometimes I like to repeat after me. So will y'all, y'all do that with me this morning? Will you engage with me this morning? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll, 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 um, I'll say what Pastor Scott always says. Thank you to those two people. Okay. So number one, core value number one, Jesus is our message. Can you say that? Jesus is our message. Why is Jesus our message? Because it's all about him. We exist because of Jesus. Like we want people to know Jesus the way that we do. We love him. Number two, people are our mission. Can you say that? You know, when you have that in your heart as your core value, your eyes are open to those around you. It's really easy. I don't know about you, but I have this thing called autopilot. Am I the only one? Like, I literally could go through the whole day and get home and be like, did I even drive home? Like, that's scary. Like, autopilot. So when people are our mission, when people are our heart, really that's what that means, people are our heart, it helps you become more aware of who's in your world that day. 
God, why did you bring this person sitting next to me at lunch today in the cafeteria when I usually don't sit by them? Like, I'm going to lean into this. Like, God brings us into people's path. People, why? Because Jesus is not walking this earth anymore. He's relying on us to shine. There's a scripture, this is not in the notes, but it says, let your light shine before men so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And then there's another scripture that says, it's your kindness through other people that brings people to repentance. So most people give their hearts to Jesus, not because they came to church and heard someone talk on stage like I'm doing today, that a lot do, but most people give their hearts to Jesus because they've been hanging out with you and they see something different about you. Isn't that good? So Jesus is our message, people are our mission. Number three, excellence is our spirit. Can you say that? Y'all are doing good this morning. You get an A. We do things and then some. That's, what, that's the sound of our house. We do things and then some. I'm not just going to do something to do it. I'm going to do it with excellence. Why? Because excellence, produ- first of all, excellence is the heart of God. When you look how, like, I encourage you, go back and read how he set up the original portable church. Y'all know we're not the only portable church. The original church was portable with Moses. Man, that was a big set up, tear down team. But with big teams means there's a lot of organization. Everything was excellent. And so excellence is our spirit. Why? Because excellence produces safety. When you come in, you have kids, you check them in at kids point, you feel safe leaving them there. Why? Because things are set up excellent. If the walls were all falling and, and the t-shirts were all dirty, you think you would have left your kids? Well, maybe some of you would have, but <laughs> I probably would have. No, um, but excellence produces safety. So excellence is our spirit. Number four, four one of my favorites, joy is our choice. Y'all are getting good at this. We don't believe that joy is a result of having a good day. We believe that joy is an intentional choice that we make. And then when you, and the best thing about it is like, I've really had to train my thought. Like you can train your thought. Have you ever had a bad day or my, you know, like you wake up in the morning, you spill your coffee, you have to change your clothes, your kids are being bad, your husband's being even worse. I heard some of you say amen. Then you like try to take it back really quick. And, and that, that can, I mean, like, that used to set my tone for the day. I'm like, well, this is the kind of day I'm going to have, you know. And then I've also heard people say this, especially Christians. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard anyone in the world say this. Well, that just stole my joy. Really? You let things steal your joy? <laughs> like, I want to, we really need to lean into knowing that joy is a choice. Like, I choose joy, so when I start out having a bad day, man, I reset myself and I say, no, 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 I'm choosing joy, today's going to, let's start over, restart, press the restart button, I'm going to choose joy today. I'm not going to react to my circumstances. So joy is our choice. Number five, generosity is our privilege. Why? Because we're more blessed to give than to receive. That's the words of Jesus, right? Number six, honor is our calling. We honor up, down, and all around. That's what we say here, high point. Number seven, passion is our pursuit. Well, go ahead, you can say it. Uh, Pastor Justin preached an awesome message last week about being passionate in everything you do. Think about everything you do in your everyday life. If you add passion to that, and, and man, something about passion produces gratitude in your heart. Like, I get to do this. Like, remember... What you're doing right now in your life is just a test on how quickly you're going to get to your next season. I feel like I need to say that again. What you're doing right now, whether it is if you're a student in school, man, get some passion behind it. If you, you know, I've heard people say, well, I'm just doing what I can to get by. No, 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 that's not passion. Like, like put some passion behind it. Um, Passion makes you believable. It's authentic. People want to do what you do when they see passion behind it. So passion is our pursuit. So today we're going to be talking about generosity. So are you ready for your joke this morning? Okay, so there is a, good, because I'm going to tell you anyway. So there's a pastor, and the church finances were a little bit low, and he was needing more money, and the bank accounts was like, today we're teaching about generosity. And the church got quiet because no one likes to talk about money. In fact, I'm sure a couple people got up and walked out, you know, like, why, why is generosity such a hard topic? And so the pastor thought, I'm going to give an incentive this morning. So, so church, we're going to talk about generosity, and our funds are a little low, so we're going to take up an offering, and whoever gives the most money is going to get to pick out three hymns. 
So the lady on the organ started playing. They started they started passing the offering plate and the pastor, the, the ushers brought the pastor the offering plate and he looked in there and to his surprise, there was a hundred dollar bill. And he was so excited. He was like, someone gave $100 today. Like this generosity message is working. Whoever that is, if you will raise your hand, you're gonna, I'm, you're gonna, you can come forward. I'd like to honor you. This little old saintly lady from the back raised her hand. She said, I gave it, Pastor. And he said, come on down, sister. I want you to come down. Everybody gave her applause. She comes on down. He's, he's like, okay, you get to pick three hymns. What would you like? you pick. She turned around. She was so, her face lit up. She looked out at the three most handsome men in the audience. She said, I'll pick him and him and him. That was a good one, wasn't it? I told you. Have you ever heard that one, Dewey? <laughs> That's good. Huh? So we're going to be diving into generosity. And the reason why we say generosity is our privilege. Like I said before, the scripture Acts 20, 25, you know, it's the actual only one, one time, the only part in the Bible where the apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Acts, and he's teaching people how to give and how to be generous and how to grow in their generosity. And he uses, he actually quotes the words of Jesus. He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I started to really ponder this and I'm like, why am I more blessed when I give? And I realize that Jesus is really just simple. It wasn't one of those hard, dig deep scriptures. It's that I'm blessed. Like I have the resources to give. Like I live a blessed life. So we are truly more blessed when we're able to give. So how the question today, the big idea, like where I want to take you today is I really want you to open your hearts into growing in generosity. We never arrive, no matter where we are in, in our lives. And you heard Parker say a few minutes ago, our Connections pastor, that we are a church of next steps. There's always a next step to take. And I really want you to go into your heart and say, God, how do you want me to grow today? Like, have your way in my heart. Help us to grow. So I really want us to grow in generosity. And let me tell you, this is a hard one for me to talk about because it is not my biggest strength. And I know y'all think I'm just this great, generous person, but the struggle's real. No, I, you know, how this came about is that um, we, in our, in our um, growth track class, we do a spiritual gifts assessment. And it's all from a scripture in Corinthians that says that we all have um, our physical gifts that God's given us. Like some people, I talked about this morning, um, a young man in our church who um, is Olympic level track star. He has a gift, a physical gift of running. Um, we have people in our church that own businesses and it's like every decision they make, it's always producing this, this next level, these decisions. Why? Because they have that gift of business, entrepreneurship upon their life. It's a gift. I saw someone on our dream team teaching the four-year-olds two weeks ago, um, Miss Carolyn Ringette. Um, I just started crying because she's, she's teaching these kids and she's lighting up and like she's coming to life and the kids are like just eating out of her finger. I mean, they're like just totally engaged in her, in her message that she gets. Four-year-olds, why? She has a gift of teaching. Do you see what I mean? We all have these these physical gifts and they help us in our life. But there's also this thing called our spiritual gifts. So I took this test and the lowest spiritual gift was giving. I was like, oh, God, I've, been, I've given my tithes and offerings all my entire life. I'm a preacher's kid. I was voluntold to give my tithes when I was little. I was like, no, you are given. But I'm so grateful to my dad because I, I didn't know, I wouldn't have, it's easy for me now to do it. But I say all that to say I didn't understand it. I'm like, I'm generous. And, and of course, you know, God's not going to argue with you. I mean, like, those tests don't lie, you know. I tried to take it, like, three times after that and still got the same result. Like, what's going on here? So I'm like, God, will you help me to grow in generosity? I want to grow in my generosity. And the more I begin to study it, I realize that generosity is not just about money. A generous heart, in fact... The word generosity means big, abundant, open heart. That's what generosity, gen, being generous means. So I set on, out on this journey to grow in my generosity. 
And setting out on that journey, I realized that it's really four things. We're going to talk about those in a moment. And you can just remember this like this. It's the four T's. It's my time, my talent, my things, my, my, um, the things that I have in my life, um, material things. And there's nothing wrong with those. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. And my treasure, which is money. So it's actually four things. Money is just a fourth of that. And so I really, when God took me down this journey and began to grow, I started realizing these things. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, this is Jesus. He said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So I got to thinking about that scripture. I'm like, moths and vermin, which by the way, vermin are rats, which is just, I don't know why rats were even created. Guess they're somewhere in the food chain. I don't know. But vermin and moss, all they do is eat away at the things that I love, that I worked hard for. They destroy. And then thieves, have you ever been, has anyone ever stolen something from you before? Like broken into your home or your car or stole something? I'm not not talking about the people that use that as an excuse because they lost something. They stole that. Dad, my shoes got stolen at school. Well, were they in your bag? No, I left them in the cafeteria. Well, <laughs> you know, keep it up with your stuff. I'm not talking about that, but if you, have, if a thief has ever broken in and stolen from you, you feel violated. I don't know about you, but I, I, we had our car broken into one time at home and they took, this is back in the day when, when, um, when DVD, remember DVD players and DVDs? Yeah. Well, we had the, the, we had the DVD, um, whatever, screens in the back of the, our little um, Suburban. Do you remember that day? Now everybody watches on their iPhone. But we, we had it custom put in, these TVs in the back of Suburban, because when you're going on a road trip with five kids, I mean, anything helps you survive. It's like, thank you, DVD player, DVDs, right? And so we had a stack of DVDs in there. We had our camera. We'd just gotten back from vacation. I had my purse in there that I'd left in there from the night before. Everything was gone. I was so angry. I was like, why don't they get a job? Why are they breaking in and stealing from me, right? So it gives you a picture of the way you feel. But Jesus is saying here, don't store up treasures in heaven. You can't take it with you. You want to hear another joke? So there's this guy... And he didn't like, he didn't like that. He's like, I can take it with me. I'm going to prove that I can take these treasures here on earth. I've worked hard. He was a very successful man. He's like, I'm going to prove that I can, I can take it with me when I go to heaven. So here's what I want you to do, kids. And he told his family, he said, when I die, I've got this, this safe that I had made that's, that is going to be, I want you to wrap it around me like a belt. And then I want you to put the keys in my pockets. And so that it makes sure no one else knows where it is and no one tries to take it, like people burying me and all that. And so he died. He, he wakes up in heaven. He's stand, standing at the pearly gates. And an angel comes out to greet him. And he's like, welcome home. And he's like, thanks. Hey, I want to prove to you that you can take your treasures on earth up here in heaven. So the angel said, okay, what, what are you talking about? So he takes his key, he unlocks that safe, and he pulls out two gold bars. He's like, I, I've worked my whole life right here. My kids don't deserve this. I do. So I brought it with me. Two gold bars. And the angel said, oh, that's great. You brought pavement. <laughs> You'll get that on your way home. Some of you will. So God doesn't even think why. The, the kingdom of God's upside down. He doesn't even think what, like we think. That's a scripture. He says, I don't, your thoughts are not my thoughts. He's wanting us to really be encouraged in partnering and doing things, things his way. When we do things God's way, we can't go wrong, right? Store up treasures on earth. Don't tre- store up treasure, treasures on earth. Store up treasures in heaven. So how do we store up treasures in heaven? By growing our generosity, by putting our treasure into people instead of things. So there are two things that we're going to talk about generosity in a minute, but I want to read this scripture because I was studying for this message and I realized that there's actually, again, God's way of doing things, there's actually a system, a law, a rhythm of generosity. 
And I noticed this for the first time in this scripture, and I want to share it with you today. 2 Corinthians 9 says this, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. And as a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. So they're not only going to thank God, but they're going to worship him. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. Then I love this part. It says, thank God for this gift too wonderful for words. Isn't that beautiful? Generosity is known as a gift too wonderful for words. So two things we know about generosity from this scripture is that God is generous. Would you agree that everything we have or everything that you have is because God gave it to you? If you think about, like, let's just take a moment and just reflect on all the blessings God's given to us. Like, everything we have is because of him. God is generous. So out of this scripture, I notice, like I said before, a rhythm of generosity. So let's go over that for a minute. You'll see it on the screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have from, it says, for God is the one who provides the seed. So that's the first thing we see is that God provides seed. So what is seed? Seed is anything that comes into your home as any sort of resource, probably mainly income, okay? So we have seed, and then God provides, I, I, he increases my resources. So it says, then I plant the seed, I eat some and give some away, because you'll see in a minute that God gives us these resources to enjoy, okay? And then my resources are increased. There's a physical harvest, so I plant seed, I get back more. Do you know that when you plant seed, you don't get kernel for kernel? When you plant a seed, I don't know what's going on with me this morning. It's because I yelled at everybody in the first service. I was preaching hard. They really needed to be generous, so I really got them good. No, but when you plant seed, you reap. God's into multiplication. You're going to reap more back. Does that make sense? So let me just give you a little illustration. When we, we just got back from Dallas, um, taking um, Cannon to uh, Pastor's Kids Camp out there at Fellowship Church in Dallas. And we're in this big city. You know, Dallas is a big city. And we're up on an overpass, so we're able to see this aerial view. But we looked over, and I'm talking in the middle of big buildings, like high-rise buildings, hotels, gas stations. We're in the middle of the city, and we look over, and there, I kid you not, there is this cornfield and it's harvest time. I mean, the stalks of corn, tons and tons of stalks of corns are coming out. You can even see the farmer's house. You can see all the material he uses to reap, to sow and reap. It was amazing. And it was so crazy to us that, that over the years, that's still there. You know, that's probably been there for generations after generations and they just didn't want to sell. They wanted to keep their farm. But I'm saying that to say when that, that, that farmer knows something about harvest and seed, that he planted that corn kernel, that seed, and reaped an abundance of corn. And so, you know, I got to thinking about that. God provided that first seed, but what if that farmer had went in and boiled that corn cob and fed it to his family? Thank you, Lord, for providing and the, ate, the, ate the seed. He would have never had that harvest that he had that we saw from that overpass. Are you following me? And there were so many times when I would be like, God, you're no respecter of persons. And why are you blessing this Christian family more than my family? I don't understand. We're even in the ministry. Like, and God showed me that. He was like, you keep eating the seed. And then you stand in front of this crop that someone else has planted and with blood, sweat, and tears. And, and you're like, it's not fair. Why isn't this my harvest? And he's like, I love you just as much as I love them. You just keep eating the seed. There's a rhythm of generosity here. It's a rhythm of generosity. So again, God provides a seed and increases my resources. And I plant, I plant the seed first. And then I eat some because there's some for your enjoyment. And then I give some away then my increases are increased again because there's a harvest. That's a physical harvest. Then that in return produces a harvest of generosity in me. You following now? I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm giving more away and more is coming back so that I can bless someone else. So that's the rhythm of generosity. And then it says the person in need will give thanks to God. 
And then they also give glory to God. They worship God. Lives are changed. And then it proves my obedience to the good news. Well, there's also a rhythm in scarcity. So I want to show that too. Because this is where I was getting stuck. Okay? God provides a seed. I eat the seed. There's no harvest. Now I'm just mad and angry. It's not fair. What am I doing wrong? No generosity. Well, that didn't work. No benefactors. There's not someone that's been that's the beneficiary of that blessing. Therefore, there's no fruit. And it's a stuck cycle. Isn't that interesting? And that's all found right here in 2 Corinthians. And I realized that if what's in my hand right now, I started to stretch myself so I could grow in generosity. If what's in my hand right now is not big enough to meet my need, then it must be a seed. So I'm going to plant it so that more harvest will come and I can give more away and I can grow in my, in, in the, in my generosity. You know, there was a time when, when um, we didn't know this rhythm and we were stuck. You remember those days? I never want to go back to those days. They were hard. So I really begin, like I told you before, I really begin, Scott and I both prayed. And we're like, God, teach us to be generous. And God started, you know, first of all, be careful when you ask God to teach you to grow your generosity because he teaches us by taking us through it. But here's what I realized about him and in the scripture, but also in my experience is that God will never ask you to give something you don't have. He's not going to ask you to give your house away if the bank owns it. Okay, so just take a deep breath. He's not going to ask you to give your car away if it's being financed. But he will ask you to give things away that you have. What's in your hand? Parker, my son-in-law, preached an amazing message a couple weeks ago about satisfaction guaranteed. And it was a story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And, you know, these are Jesus' disciples. He was like, they were like, Jesus, this is before he fed them. He was doing miracles all day. They're like, send them home. They, they've got to eat. And we, we didn't bring enough money to feed them. This is not on us. Jesus, send them home. And you know what Jesus said? You feed them. And immediately, I'm telling you, you want to know this, the test of your generosity, like the growth of it, like the capacity of it, is when you're asked to give something away, what's your initial reaction? And their initial reaction was, us feed them. It would take mu- Did you forget we gave up everything to follow you, first of all? Second of all, if we did have our job still, doing, you know, fishing, like you called us away from that. If we still had our jobs, like, like it would take us months, maybe even a year to have enough money to feed them. Again, I don't think like you think. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Take a moment and go see what you have. Do y'all remember the message? So they calmed themselves down and they, they got together and, and figured out what they had. They gave it to Jesus Jesus blessed it. You can see the whole rhythm of generosity in this story. And he multiplied it, right? So it's just, it really is a mindset. So there's two things that we see here in generosity. Number one, we already talked about it, that God is generous. The second thing is that we are called to be generous. We're called to be generous. In fact, it's not really a calling, it's a mandate. That as a believer, if, now if, you're, if you haven't made that step and accepted Jesus in your heart, you're exempt from this. But if you call yourself Christian, if you're a child of God, if you gave your heart to Jesus, Jesus and you said, I want to follow you and I want to reflect the heart of God and the culture of heaven, it's a mandate to grow in our generosity. Matthew 10, 8 says, give as freely as you have received. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 It says, command, there's that mandate, command those who are rich in this present world. Now, don't just shut your mind off because you're, okay, because I did this. I'm like, I'm not rich, so check, like move. This has nothing to do with me. I'm not rich. I'm a pastor. And this is what God showed me. If you got into a car and drove to this air conditioner building, you're rich. If you live in America, you're rich. If you have a pocket computer, also known as an iPhone (laughs) or an Android, you're rich, okay? If you are rich in this world, in this present world, teach them not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for what? 
God wants us to enjoy our harvest. It's for our enjoyment. He wants you to go on a nice vacation. He wants you to have nice things, but he doesn't want you to get stuck in the scarcity mentality either. Isn't that good? Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure. There's the word treasure again. You want to know how to store up treasure in heaven? Like this. They'll lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. I could tell you story after story of how God grew my generosity, but there's one I want to share with you this morning because God really got me on this one and I get emotional because I'm so honored that God would teach me these things and take me through them. And they're crazy things that you can't make up so you know that it's God. But there was a time in my life where I told you God was growing my generosity. I'm like, okay, God, I know, that, I know the rhythm. I know that you provide the seed. So, so who, who do you, you know, God told me, I want you to buy a gift for this person and, and showed me the person. I'm like, my first thought was, but they're always the one giving and blessing other people. They, they really don't need anything. Duh, like God doesn't know that. Because a lot of times God will ask me to give someone a need. But this time he flipped the script and he was like, no, 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 that's just the point. They are like the biggest givers and no one ever gives to them. And that made me sad. I'm like, that, that's true. Like people are asking them all the time for resources and this and that. They're very generous people, this family. I'm like, I got excited about it. It was Christmas time. I'm like, okay, God, I got five kids and, and uh, it's Christmas time, and I'm, I'm going to do this. And told me exactly what to buy. What to buy. And I'm like, I, I got excited because I'm learning to grow in generosity. And, and um, I'm like, okay, provide seed, Lord. You're going to give me this money because I knew how much this gift costs. And, and then I kind of put it on the shelf. I forgot about it. A week later, I'm standing in the line of, of the Verizon store because all five of my kids wanted a new iPhone. That's expensive, right? But it was also... Um, I think it was Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, so it's like, buy one, get one free. Don't tell them that. But I'm like, I'm going to stand in line for this. And I'm standing in line, and I, I remember that because you never forget when a crazy moment happens, right? You remember every detail of your life. And all of a sudden, I get this text message, and there's no name on it. It's just a number. So the person was not in my, in my database, and it said, um, uh, you know, good morning, um, Kelly. I need to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. That's what it said. I need your cash app, please. I need to send you some money. And I'm like, what? Let the good Lord lead you, you know, like hallelujah. I'm like, it's a good day for me. Totally forgot about God asking me to give a gift to someone. That was not even on my radar. And so I'm like, this has got to be a scam because this person's not in my database. And so I just text back and I'm like, Literally, I was like, let the good Lord lead you, exclamation point. Here's my cash app. <laughs> yeah, I know, how embarrassing, right? Seconds later, $1,000 appears in my cash app. I'm like, what? This is, no, what in the world? What in the world? So I text the person back. Now I'm a little embarrassed because of what I said before. Now I'm like, um, thank you so much. Like, who is this, please, question mark? <laughs> Have you ever done that before? Like, and then and then you lie and go, you know, I got a new phone. I lost my contacts. <laughs> so I knew I couldn't do that. I can't lie to her. She, I mean, the Holy Spirit talks to her, right? She tells me her name. I'm like, thank you so much. Like, I don't even know what to say. That the Holy Spirit would speak to you and tell you to do this. And now, then I'm like, I'm in that line, man, I want to take off and do a lap in the Verizon store. I'm like, favor ain't fair, amen, Jesus loves me. I'm going to go buy myself a Christmas present, wrap it up, put it under the tree, say it's from the Holy Spirit, this is great. And all of a sudden I remembered, no, 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 don't you eat that seed. I told you what to do with that money. So then I start crying in the Verizon store. Like, Y'all, people probably thought it was crazy. I'm like, oh, i got to get to that store and buy this gift. You know, I couldn't wait. And it was a specific store that you had to go stand in line at at the Galleria. So I'm like, i got to get there. I call Scott. I'm like, I need you to take me to the store right now. He's like, what are you, what are you talking about? I tell him the story. He couldn't believe it. And I go buy this gift, and I give it to this person. And, and they were just overwhelmed. That They even had a hard time receiving it. That's how much of generous these people are. 
Why do I tell you that? I tell you because this rhythm of generosity is a real thing. It reaped a heart of generosity in my heart. It, it did something for the person, that, the benefactor. They gave glory to God because he would think of them and love them that much. And the fact, this person couldn't get over the fact that he laid it upon someone else's heart. Do you see the rhythm here? To, to give it to me because God knew he could trust that he could get it through me. And that they received this blessing and gave glory to God because that's never happened to them before. There's a rhythm of generosity that God wants us to learn. All right, I'm going to go really fast because I'm running out of time. So you all have to be really good note takers. Are you all ready? I'm going to go through this part really quick. There's a world that the generous live in that we can be a part of too. Generosity, the world of the generous, generosity opens doors. That's what it does. It's a real thing. Proverbs 11.24 says, The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Proverbs 18.16 says, A gift opens the way and ushers the giver into the presence of the great. Generosity produces more increase. You saw that in the in the, um, the rhythm there in that scripture. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. The generous love to give. They love it. They, they have that heart of generosity. They love it. They live for it. Proverbs 21, 26 says, Some people are always greedy for more, but the godly love to give. The generous are blessed. They live under an umbrella of blessing. Proverbs 22, 9 says, blessed are those who are generous because they feed the poor. You know, we have an opportunity to to be a blessing to this family Saturday, to give of our time. God will bless you for giving that time if you do serve day with us Saturday. Maybe you say, you know, I, I didn't know about it ahead of time. I'm not going to be able to serve. You, if you will, you, I'm going to say this probably without permission, but I know that Pastor Scott will back me up. But if you say I can't serve Saturday, but I can give, go online to myhighpointchurch.com or the text to give, or we have giving receptacles out here. But if you want to give into the project, that everything that you give, you can put under missions for today, and we will, we will bless that family somehow groceries furniture whatever they need on saturday the generous are rewarded proverbs 19 17 says if you help the poor you are lending to the lord and he will repay you so if i were to come up here and talk about this but not give us a call to action i would be doing you an injustice and myself too so i'm going to give you some action steps again next steps what are some action steps to grow in your generosity And I'm going to go through these quickly. There's four. Number one, let's be generous with our time. I hear people say it all the time. I'm out of time. I don't have time. I'm too busy. You'll be surprised. If you will give God your time, he will multiply it back to you. Just like resources, money, anything. He'll give it back to you. What do you mean by that, Pastor Pastor Kelly? Well, let me encourage you. Instead of looking at your phone, the first thing you do when you wake up and checking your emails, open your Bible. Give your time to God. Give him the first part of your time. If you need a good Bible, get the daily Bible. I read out of every day. It takes 10 minutes. It's a little bit of Proverbs, a little bit of Psalms. It's a, um, a, some Old Testament, New Testament. It's so good. And if you stick to that 10 minutes a day, you'll read through the Bible in a year. And God, I mean, that's not the goal to read through the Bible. It's just how much your heart will grow from just consuming the Word. Spend time with God. Talk to Him. Tell Him your needs. Tell him your fears. Let him talk back to you. Spend time with people. Invest in people. Be willing to carve time out to where you're going to take time and sit with someone different and talk to them. Get to know their story. Be generous with your talent. God wants us to be generous with our talent. Giving your talent to serve. Serve. Serve at High Point Church. Serve in your church if this is not your church home. Sign up for the the dream team. Our dream team is our group of volunteers here. And and serve in a way that brings you fulfillment. Don't serve where there's need. Serve where you're you're fulfilled with your gifting and talent. Just like the sweet lady that I talked about that teaches our four-year-olds. You don't don't want to put Pastor Scott in the four-year-olds. It wouldn't be good. (laughs) Like serve where you love. 
He's a good grandfather, but teaching four-year-olds for an hour. Be generous with your things. What is God giving you that you can share with others and lend? Lend to them. We took our interns on a, um, we have a group of young people during the summer, college and college age, and they interned with us for the summer. So we took them on a retreat and someone in our small group said, hey, why don't you take um, this? I have a, I have a van that'll fit everybody. Why don't you take my van? Why don't you borrow our van? We were like, okay, you know, I'm thinking a 15 passenger white van, you know, that was in my head. It was a party van. Like we were, it was like a first class jet on wheels. We went to the Frio and, and I mean, in first class, I'm telling you why, because he shared his things with us. Be generous with your things. If you have a vacation home, find a, a family that's struggling and let them stay in it. Take their family on vacation. I don't know. Whatever God tells you. Number four, he wants us to be generous with our treasure. That's our money. I really want to encourage you to learn to give God the first and best of all your resources. Why do we say here? Why do we encourage you to tithe? Because it's 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 at 10%. Well, the Bible says to you one, but... That 10% is a good line to, to, for how the Bible says to give the, an amount that you get, that you receive, you know, give in, in a, in, um, what am I, I'm trying to use a math word here. <laughs> I'm getting tied up with my words, but get, it's a good um, ratio there. That's the word I'm trying to find for you to start. I, I've heard people say, pastor, I can't give 10%. I, I'm struggling then start somewhere. One percent. It is not a law. It's a, it's a, it's a rhythm of generosity, and we want you to be free. Amen. Start somewhere. Let's pray this morning. God, we love you, and we thank you that you're teaching us to, to grow in even parts that are hard in our life, Lord, like generosity. Lord, we want to truly be a representation of you, Father. We want to love people through you, Lord, so help us to grow in our generosity. Lord, Psalm 139 says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting. Lord, we ask you to search our hearts this morning. Lord, anything, God, that you need from us, Lord, I just pray that every person here will give it freely. Lord, just, Lord, for those that have things they've been holding on to, Lord. I just pray that they'll just open up their heart to you this morning. If you're here, I want to talk to two groups of people this morning. If you're here and maybe you said, man, I want to have a heart of generosity, but I've really never made Jesus Lord of my life. Or maybe you have at one time and you've just slipped backwards or, you know, you just haven't, your relationship hasn't been the same. Maybe a circumstance happened and kind of put a wedge in between your relationship with God. And you're ready to rededicate this morning. I want to use this time to give you the opportunity to do that. So if that's you, if, you know, no one else is looking around, I just want to see who I'm agreeing with. If you want to give your heart to Jesus for the first time or you want to rededicate your life, if you'll just slip your hand up just so God can see it really. We won't embarrass you. I won't come to you. I won't say anything. I see several hands going up. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to lift their hand up? I want to give, always want to give everybody the opportunity to say, fresh start today. Fresh start today. Thank you. Let's, let's um, say this prayer together so we don't embarrass anyone. As a family, if you'll just repeat after me, God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus, who died on the cross and gave his life as a sacrifice so that I could have eternal life. I lay my sins at your feet. I lay my past struggles at your feet and my present struggles. Just say, God, help me from this day forward to live for you. In Jesus' name. I also want to pray for those that want to grow in their generosity. I hope that's everybody here. I just want you to open your heart as I pray this prayer over all of us. God, help us to grow in our generosity. Lord, the stingy areas in our life, Lord, just take it out. We just give you permission to just do heart surgery. Just take out those areas, Lord. Let us be obedient to your voice when you ask us to give some, to someone in need or, Lord, to um, help a struggling family or to give um, to give to build the, the church, the kingdom of God. Lord, whatever it is in our life, Lord, grow our generosity. Lord, we want to be in that rhythm of generosity, not just so that not so that we can get things, but so we can be kingdom-minded, Lord. We can do things your way. We can have the culture of heaven. 
Lord, and so really the ultimate purpose so we can make the difference in someone else's life. We love you. We dedicate everything that we have to you. We dedicate our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this message, we want to encourage you to subscribe and to also share it on social media. You can always jump over to our website, myhighpointchurch.com. Click the giving link. What that does is it helps us to continue to share the message of Jesus Christ across the world. God bless you and remember, you can do all things through Christ.